right, so let's officially begin. Um, my name is Mako Nagasawa. It's great to see you all here. You are at Reconstruction, a Zoom class that, um, that we host. I'm the director of the Anastasis Center for Christian Education and Ministry. Our little logo is right up there at the upper right-hand corner. And uh, we're exploring the deep roots of early Christian theology. So that's where you are in case you, you st stumbled into the, uh, the wrong Zoom meeting, but I'm really glad that you're here. And um, let, me, let me explain what it is that we're doing. Uh, the motivation for reconstruction, the class, is, uh, it, it is to complement, um, and, and I, I really do mean that, it is to complement this kind of wave of deconstruction that's happening. Many people are deconstruct, deconstructing Christian faith. And I, I think there are good reasons to do that. <laughs> there are many, many good reasons to do that. Um, I won't go into all of them, but you, you probably, if you're here, you probably have done some of that yourself. Certainly I have. And, um, you know, I, I think maybe if, if you, you know, stumbled into here, you're, you're seeing some common outcomes, which is if we think of, um, you know, a faith tradition or, or even just our, our personal faith as a house that you feel safe inviting other people into, you, you get worried at times that I, I wonder if like part of the house has collapsed a little too much. Like, what do I do about that? Um, or are there holes in the roof? Are, are we getting leaks here that, you know, is it, is it unpleasant to be here? And, and so if you think in, in that metaphorical sense, you know, you, you have to wonder, yeah, what is the goal of deconstruction? Is it just so that I can feel good about what I'm believing? Well, I, I hope that's part of it, but I, I hope we think about it like a house because, uh, you know, when you have somewhere to invite other people, I think it makes life a lot more meaningful and, <laughs> and satisfying. And so when you think about why do we construct anything at all, it, it's to share space. And so we look at early Christianity in order to discern what a strong foundation could be. Now, <clears throat> uh, the, the process that we do that in these nine sessions is we, we identify some controversial issues that are being debated in Western Christianity. We, we look at early Christian views on that issue and we identify if, where, and why Christians shifted on the issue. The, the hope there is to recover a framework for approaching the issue in today's context. And so this is kind of the outline of the next uh, nine weeks that we're going to spend together on Saturday mornings, uh, where the format will be generally, uh, I will, uh, in the first 90 minutes will be a combination of like me giving a lecture and, and setting also time to discuss in Zoom breakout rooms. And so uh, today we're starting on slavery. Next week we're looking at women in the early church. By the way, if if you wouldn't mind uh, managing your mute, you know, uh, muting your microphone, uh, folks would appreciate. I would appreciate that. And um, I'm recording these sessions so that the folks who who miss uh, the session could have it. It's it'll be on my Zoom cloud, and I'll uh, send out the link you know, within a day and, and essentially um, uh, keep folks up to speed. So uh, uh, in mid-May, we'll look at the goodness of God and the healing of creation, according to Athanasius of Alexandria. How do we actually do ministry? Uh, next, we'll look at hell. The topic of hell is certainly being discussed. Does God have a dark side? How did the early church think about hell? The next two weeks, we'll, we'll think about scripture. How authoritative is scripture? Do we really need it? And then the following week will be, is the Bible the product of empire or violence? And, and um, there's different ways we have of, of coming at that question. The following week, uh, we'll look at politics, the church, and Jesus's restorative justice. Uh, maybe, maybe like me, you've been wondering about the the rise in what's called Christian nationalism. W what do we think about that? How would the early church have thought about it? Uh, we will also look at sexual ethics and the new creation, and then we'll round off this uh, reconstruction 
class with the person, the face, and the climb up the mountain. Gregory of Nyssa and the Shaping of Desire, as we'll look at one of the most influential uh, pieces of the, the early church. Um, all right, so that's, that's our outline. And today we're going to look at slavery, how the early church got it right. Um, this is what you can hold me to. Okay, so I'm, I, I'm going to try to try to hold to this schedule. You can see, you know, that, that we'll have a little bit of discussion time after the first um, uh, topic there, early Christian abolition. I'll go through then Old Testament and New Testament, and then we'll have some time to discuss there. So, uh, and, and then we'll also look at um, briefly slavery and colonialism and US history. Uh, I do wanna mention also that you, you can definitely uh, put comments in the chat box and uh, Biota and Ian McDonald are, are, are TAs for the class and they will uh, try to keep track of those uh, comments. Or if, if something can be answered really quickly, uh, they, uh, they'll, they'll try to answer it. Uh, otherwise, when we come into discussion time or especially at the end when we have open Q&A, they will, they will remind me of some of your comments and questions. Um, because I have a hard time managing, like, what is it that my slides are telling me to say? And, and also, what are your, what is the chat box doing? So, so, but feel free to uh, comment in the chat box, and, and that'll just be a parallel way of, um, of engaging with one another. All right, so this is uh, what we're jumping into here, early Christian abolition. Now, here's a thought to ponder, just ponder it. Uh, don't discuss it out loud, but does the Bible support slavery? I, I'm sure we've asked that at different points in time. You know, if you're an American, especially, I mean, we think about the enslavement of African Americans and also Native Americans uh, in, in the first half of U.S. history. Uh, the, it makes us ask, what does the Bible say about this? You might have heard arguments that either the Bible supports or does not support slavery. And another, so, you know, so that might be kind of a splinter in your mind. Does it? And, and does it even matter, right? Does it, does it actually matter that the Bible says anything about slavery in today's society? Maybe really all that matters is, at least in the U.S., you know, we fought the Civil War and declared that slavery is over. So, so maybe, maybe it's a moot point, but I actually want to say, I don't think it is. I think it's deeply relevant still because there are more people enslaved today in the world than ever before. There are still people enslaved in the U.S., but maybe in ways that su might surprise us if we haven't been paying attention. So here are some ways uh, it, across the globe. Number one, sex trafficking and forced prostitution is a form of slavery. Child soldiers is a form of slavery. Our, our prison, and let, let's, let's call it a criminal justice system. Uh, although some people call it a criminal injustice system. That is a form of slavery, especially because uh, private corporations Use, slate, uh, use prison labor and pay people as low as 17 cents an hour. So, and then uh, around the world, there is debt and bonded labor. That's a different form of slavery. And there are others. And so what do, what do we think then about this, especially from, the, from within the Christian tradition? Is Christian faith really a foundation stone for abolition work. What does the Bible say, really? If the Bible is ambiguous at best, can we do better? Like that might be the, the place where you currently are, or, well, I, I guess that's, that's the best we can do. So I have to, um, you know, just kind of hope for better. Uh, maybe if we grow, grow disenchanted with scripture, we need to, we feel like we need to interpret scripture metaphorically. That is actually how things, uh, a certain pattern of, of interpretation began in U.S. history is with uh, abolition. And then how do we understand U.S. history? Or if maybe if you're thinking globally, 
um, British history? How, how do we understand um, of other countries that have a history of colonialism and slavery and Christian faith? That combination is troubling. Why did that happen? So, uh, you know, if, if, if you're, if you were uh, driving along highways, th this was one uh, billboard that I saw put up and it was apparently put up by the American Atheist Association and it quotes Colossians 3.12, 3.22, slaves obey your masters. This lesson in Bronze Age ethics brought to you by the year of the Bible and the House of Representatives. I'm not sure exactly what they mean by that. And, and of course the cruelty done to African-Americans uh, by subjecting them to slavery, kidnapping them into slavery and then maintaining that by force it is just horrible. So what do we think? <clears throat> now, this is where it's really helpful to get into early Christian history. Well, what did the early Christians think? How did they approach the, the, the scriptures, but also the reality of slavery in the Greco-Roman context and in other contexts? Well, here's an example. First Clement <clears throat> is a document that follows the New Testament. Uh, Clement was an elder at Rome, and in about 90 AD, he says this, we know many among ourselves who have given themselves up to bonds in order that they might ransom others. Really? So they were emancipators. Polycarp of Smyrna and Ignatius of Antioch, also second generation leaders, free their slaves. Uh, there is a guy named Ovidius, who is Bishop of Braga. He was appointed under Pope Clement in 95 AD, and he reports emancipating 5,000 slaves over the course of his tenure there, over the course of his ministry. Also, around the turn of that century, a Roman prefect named Hermas uh, in Rome, received baptism at an Easter festival with his wife, children, and 1,250 slaves. And on that occasion, he gave all his slaves their freedom and generous gifts besides. He was that wealthy. <laughs> and, and by the way, that hits on something. Uh, in Roman law, pagan law, traditionally, if you were enslaved and your master died, you would be killed because you were considered like a potential danger to society. Like you no longer had a, a formal master. And so you would have to be killed like that and, and the property disposed of um, because you were property. So the, the Christians actually uh, took that, that principle and said, you know what? We're gonna apply it, but to baptism because when I get baptized, I do die and rise with Christ. And so, there is a real death there. And so the, the Roman Christians began this practice of, of setting their slaves free by, and, and uh, when they got baptized. So that's really cool. Another person, Chromatius, uh, about two centuries later, emancipates 1,400 slaves after they're baptized with him. Many uh, people who were enslaved also became Christians, kind of understandable, at baptism. Uh, in, the 400, uh, in the fourth century, Gregory of Nyssa, in a sermon that he preached during Lent, said this, God said, let us make man in our own image and likeness, and, and look at how he understands Genesis 1. If he is in the likeness of God, and rules the whole earth, and has been granted authority over everything on earth from God, who is his buyer? Tell me. Who is his seller? And then he goes on and says, if, but if God does not enslave what is free, who is he that sets his own power above God's? What Gregory is saying is like slavery is inconsistent with Genesis 1, with the fact that God made us to be, uh, bear his image to be free in that sense and to rule in creation. And so if you're messing with other people's rule over a part of the creation, then you're setting your power above God's and in conflict with it. John Chrysostom, one of the heavy hitters of the uh, Eastern Orthodox and, and Catholic churches, he was Archbishop of Constantinople, was teaching out of Ephesians and says this, in Christ Jesus, there is no slave. Therefore, it is not necessary to have a slave. Buy them and after you have taught them some skill by which they can maintain themselves, set them free. 
And then he's very clear that slave marriages and families need to stay together. They have the, a right before God uh, to stay together. And so anyone who, who has them uh, does not have the right, or at least Christians do not have the right to, to uh, separate them. There's this document called the Apostolic Constitutions, which is basically a, 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 a manual on how to conduct a church and especially how to run a church service. <laughs> it was used in the Greek and Syriac speaking region of Syria. And it says this, as for such sums of money as are collected from them, uh, designate them to be used for the redemption of the saints and the deliverance of slaves and captives. In other words, like, you know how you uh, today in churches, they pass around the basket <laughs> to take offering for the church budget, right? Like this is how we pay our pastoral staff, which is fine. But they did it and used it to purchase people out from slavery. They took the money and just went out and purchased people out from slavery. Interesting. Augustine of Hippo says, it, he, he also attests to this, notes that the Christian community regularly used its funds to redeem as many kidnapped victims as possible and refers to this incident where they, they freed 120 slaves that Galatians, uh, people from the Galatia region, were boarding onto their ships from North Africa. Here's another story. Acacius, Bishop of Amida in Eastern Turkey, so pushing east in uh, the Mesopotamian region, ransomed 7,000 Persian soldiers that were being held by the Romans. He sold a lot of church uh, property in order to do this. And Samuel Hugh Moffat of Princeton, uh, he's now deceased, but he was a Princeton church historian, uh, said that this actually helped end a war between uh, Rome and Persia, or Byzantium and Persia in 422. It's the actions of this guy. <laughs> the um, pushing even further east, the Nestorian Stel was erected in 635 in Chang'an, capital of China at the time, to honor Alopen, Syrian Christian priest and missionary, and the Chinese Christian community that was there. Which, by the way, at least according to this like stone pillar with the inscription on it, says that there was like a million Chinese Christians already by 635. Now, whether that's an exaggeration or not, I don't know. But it does say this. They do not keep slaves, but put noble and mean, in other words, like rich and poor, all on an equality. They do not amass wealth, but cast their property into the common stock. Sounds like Acts 2 and 4, doesn't it? Like this is common and, and, this is, and it's not just West, quote unquote, Western Christianity. It's, it's Christianity as it pressed East. But let, let's look at uh, the Christian impact on law and policy, because that's different from individual acts of emancipation, right? Emancipating people, that's all great. But when Christians start to exercise power, how do they use that power when it comes to slavery? Well, uh, we have the most data uh, about this kind of thing in Europe. And so most of my examples do come from here, beginning with Constantine. <clears throat> so Constantine... Um, in, in 313, he, I think that's, is that when he becomes emperor and issues the Edict of Milan, the toleration uh, decree of like, yeah, we'll tolerate Christianity. Uh, but it, within two years, he imposes the death penalty on those who kidnap and enslave children into slavery and forbid separating slave families. He made manumission possible at church services in order to, it, it, in order to make it really easy. Before, there was a lot of like paperwork than bureaucracy that you needed to go through. Um, and, and so Constantine was, was he a Christian? I don't know, I'm not, I'm not taking a position on that. But if regardless, like if he was a new Christian or, or maybe he was just influenced by Christian advisors, which he did have, um, this indicates that it came from Christian leaders, that the Christian community itself had a strong anti-slavery position. He did other things like he stopped uh, the practice of branding people on the face, because he said the face is the image of God in the in the clearest sense, and so we don't want to brand people on the face anymore. Very interesting. Uh, in 595, a council at Rome under Gregory the Great permits a slave to become a monk without any consent from his master. 
So if you're a slave and you run, run away to a monastery, if you want to actually do ministry, you can. Just run away. That's a huge change. <laughs> it's a huge change. Uh, and I love this example. This is uh, this statue in the upper right here is uh, Batilde. Who is Batilde? Uh, she's the wife of Clovis II, king of the Franks. In 649, uh, Clovis II freed and married, uh, freed her from slavery. She had been taken uh, 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 from the British Isles and, and then married her. Apparently, he fell in love with her and together they dismantled slavery in France. They shut down the slave trade first and then they, they after Clovis died uh, relatively early, Batilde and her son continued to eliminate slavery from the kingdom of the Franks. They said anyone uh, on, setting foot on the soil of the kingdom of the Franks would instantly be free. Uh, so someone should make a movie about that because it has all these great elements, right? Like romance, social justice, it's awesome. In 1000 AD, Stephen I of Hungary abolished slavery, same premise. Anyone setting foot on the soil of Hungary would be free. In 1102, the London Church Council abolishes slavery throughout England, emancipating 10% of England's population at that time that had still been in some form of slavery. In 1117, Iceland follows suit in a, in, by 1300, the Netherlands had abolished slavery, and in 1335, Sweden, which included Finland, makes slavery illegal. So how do these Christians understand the Bible? Um, oops, wait a second. I think I want to pause here. And at, at this point, I want to ask, uh, I, I want to uh, send you into Zoom breakout rooms and, and uh, to discuss some of these things. Uh, the, the two questions I want to ask you are, does any of this surprise you? And number two, why or why not? Were you, were you taught this before? Why or why not? Okay, so those are the two questions. I'll, I'll drop them in the chat and um, I'll, I'll just let you, Grant, if you could set people up maybe in groups of three, uh, pretty small groups and um, just talk, introduce yourselves and, um, and just you know, share who you are, where you're from and um, maybe go for five minutes. Okay, All right, so I'll go ahead and put people in. I've got groups of three and some four. I'll go ahead and open the rooms now. Thanks, and I'll, oops, and I'll put this in the chat. Uh, it so would be, oh, I've got somebody uh, assigned. Have you, thanks, we heard. Um. Okay, so two discussion questions there. Oh, awesome. Connie, did you get into a room? Yeah, I see Connie's still recording. Um, I Well, I look forward to hearing a little bit more about what the things you talked about um, in, in the Q&A at the end. I, I'll just say that um, it's, it's pretty startling, right, to look at early Christian history and to realize even though, yes, there were ups and downs, uh, and, and especially because reg regimes changed uh, pretty often. It's, it's, you know, in that sense, uh, sometimes when you get a new ruler, Christians almost had to start over. That People didn't necessarily have a commitment to, to keep on with the policies of their predecessors. And especially because of invasions like with Islam uh, and, and other things, uh, th that's really impressive. So there's a sociologist named Rodney Stark who started studying the early church as a sociologist and then decided to give his life to Jesus as the, as the result of what he found there. 
And he's like, nowhere else in the world was abolition uh, accomplished. Uh, freedom was the peculiar institution, right? It, especially in Northwestern and Northern Europe. So it behooves, uh, and that's gonna be really important when we think about England, English law, British law and the US. So how do these Christians understand the Bible? That's what we wanna look at first. I, I gave you some quotes, um, but ultimately we wanna understand like, what are they doing with scripture to derive, to, to, you know, to get these conclusions, to derive their positions? So uh, Gregory of Nyssa at length, <clears throat> um, you know, looks at Genesis 1 and says, uh, if he is in the likeness of, if a, if a person is in the likeness of God and rules the whole earth and has been granted authority over everything on earth from God, who's his buyer, who's his seller? That comes from Genesis 1, verse 26, where God says, uh, rule and subdue. And he basically, he says that to, in effect, all humanity. I mean, Adam and Eve and the, or, or, or that beginning point was representative and people were to rule together. To God alone belongs this power or rather not even to God himself for his gracious gifts, it says, are irrevocable. In other words, the power to remove someone from that place of rule doesn't even belong to God. That's what Gregory of Nyssa is saying because God does not go back on his word. God would not therefore reduce the human race to slavery since he himself when we had been enslaved to sin, spontaneously recalled us to freedom. But if God does not enslave what is free, who is he that sets his own power above God's? Wow. Wow. Chew on that for a bit. And then when he's commenting on Ecclesiastes, and he finds that Solomon says this, I acquired slaves and slave girls, says that he, he responds to Solomon. He says, what is that you say? You condemn a person to slavery whose nature is free and independent, and in so doing, you lay down a law in opposition to God. What he's saying is, <clears throat> especially with regards to uh, purchasing someone in a slave trade, he's like, That's, there's no way that is okay. So again, how does he get there? Basil of Caesarea, who's actually the older brother of Gregory of Nyssa, uh, he it's called Basil the Great in the Eastern Orthodox tradition, major leader, uh, says marriage between slaves is just as valid. Slaves are just as human. We talked about that a little bit before. There's a source, Epistle 199. Uh, one of the things that we'll see is that 1 Corinthians matters a great deal to the early Christians. Here's why. In 1 Corinthians, Paul says, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own. For you have been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. Basically, he's saying your individual body was meant to be a temple, a place where the Holy Spirit dwells. And in effect, Jesus is the leading partner in, a, in, in this partnership that you and he have about your body. Like Jesus owns your body, He's the leading partner in how we, you use your body. And, and so that has ramifications. Now, in the next chat, in chapter seven, you know, he, <laughs> Paul then applies that principle. And that's why he talks about singleness. Um, and that's the passage that a lot of Christians like tremble about. I love that passage because basically Paul says like, yeah, of course I want, as many people to be single as possible because yeah marriage is a good thing but but it involves sharing authority over your body with someone else and and so if jesus is the primary authority over your body then you have to be really careful it's not that marriage is bad but that singleness is actually great <laughs> because it leaves room for jesus but that becomes also the same rationale with which Paul challenges slavery. How, and, and slavery at this point is a broad, very broad term. We'll get into that in just a second. He says this, were you called while a slave? Don't worry about it. 
But if you are able to become free, rather do that. For he who was called in the Lord while a slave is the Lord's freedman. Likewise, he who was called while free is Christ's slave. You were bought with a price. Notice the repetition. You have been bought with a price in chapter 6. You were bought with a price in chapter 7. And that means that this phrase, do not become slaves of men, is parallel to glorify God in your body. Y'all see that? Follow the italics. There's a parallelism there. Does anyone else see that? Yep. People who preach from 1 Corinthians, like John Chrysostom. When he's preaching on 1 Corinthians, he says this. Uh, basically, he, he refers to Joseph in, in the book of Genesis. Even though Joseph was a slave, he did not yield to being a sex slave. That's what he says, right? Like, yeah, you were a slave, but there are limits. In fact, there, there are limits set to slaves by God himself. And up to what point one ought to keep them has also been determined. Ooh. And to transgress them is wrong. Namely, when your master commands nothing which is unpleasing to God, it's right to follow and to obey. But no further. For thus the slave becomes free. But if you go further, even though you're free, you've become a slave. At least he intimates this saying, be not the become not the servants of men or slaves of men. Right? He's quoting that very phrase. So there's limits. And uh, another example would be, how did the early Christians view prostitution? This is uh, from the, this is a reflection from, I believe, a medieval historian. And there's a, there was a council called the Synod of Elvira, which took, it, it was a gathering of Christian leaders of bishops in Spain in about 306 AD. And, and they began to uh, share, share their uh, decisions with one another as Christian leaders and like, hey, we should, we should basically do the same thing here. And, and so they decided this, prostitutes were supposed to register with the authorities a state tax on these registered prostitutes was, the, she, she's describing the, his, the history part. Uh, I'll just read the, the, the part that I highlighted in yellow. Although the church fathers fulminated against the commerce of the body with the same ferocity as against other sins of the flesh, rampant in the Roman world, prostitution being a social phenomenon rather than a personal sin, such as fornication, did not, strictly speaking, lie within the spiritual jurisdiction of the church. In other words, the church leaders said prostitution is a social problem, but being a prostitute is not a personal sin. Why did they say that? Well, <clears throat> canonical wrath was focused on those who profited from the commerce. For while prostitution was regarded as a social phenomenon distinct from the sin of fornication, procuring or buying sex from a prostitute was considered by the church to be synonymous with a sinful act of encouraging debauchery, since the latter is usually associated with a pecuniary motive, whereas fornication can be committed out of passion as well as out of desire for money. Procuring was therefore considered to be a matter of spiritual juris jurisdiction, and strong measures were taken against it at the Council of Elvira, and basically Christians followed suit ever since then. Essentially, they could imagine all kinds of reasons why a woman might be a prostitute. Maybe she was impoverished. Maybe she, uh, her parents had abandoned her when she was a baby and she was picked up by a pimp. Maybe she was being blackmailed. There are all kinds of understandable reasons why a woman would be a prostitute that was not her fault. It was a social situation that was bad. We want to get her out of it, but, but she's not to blame for being a prostitute. Who is to blame is the guy who buys sex from the prostitute. You follow me? That's today, we call that the Nordic progressive model because the Nordic countries have used it. It has been shown to be the only model by which we can reduce uh, the number of uh, women and children abducted into human trafficking. And, and so it, which is fascinating that like hundreds of years later, uh, we are back to this, but the church, developed it first. Oh, my goodness. Uh, this is where I wanted to put the discussion. I'm so sorry. I messed up. Um, 
what do you think of the biblical arguments against slavery based on humanity? I'm gonna I'm gonna keep you in this room if that's okay because I I missed it. What do you? I'm gonna focus in on the this question. What do you think of the the biblical arguments against slavery based on humanity being made in the image of God, and the human body is meant for the Holy Spirit? And is this a selective reading of Scripture? What do you think? Were the early Christians right to form their beliefs about slavery around these passages? So if you could, well, I'm going to keep this together. Please unmute yourselves and tell me and share with others, what do you think? Thoughts? I have some some quick thoughts just about Genesis one. I I think that is unique, um, or at least I I don't see that reflected a lot in modern Christian thought. This idea that all humans uh, should experience the same level of yeah, authority over creation. Um, I think what I've experienced in modern Christianity is that it's just accepted that hierarchy is and domination is just a part of being human when yeah. the early Christian church is saying, no, quite the opposite is a part of being human. Very important point, Micah. And I will say that a lot of people want to read Ephesians and Colossians because there's the, what's called the household codes which addresses, you know, slave, slave and master, also addresses like, you know, husband, wife, parent, child, those kinds of relationships. A and then the idea is, oh, I guess Jesus just accepts human hierarchies wherever they are, and then makes them more binding. But actually, if you read First Corinthians, for, before you read Ephesians, and by the way, Paul wrote First Corinthians before he wrote Ephesians. He wrote 1 Corinthians from Ephesus, in fact, which really ought to tell us something. If you read 1 Corinthians first, what you, what you get the impression of is Jesus interrupts all human hierarchy, right? Jesus inserts himself into human hierarchy and says, nope, you can go no further than, maybe it's tolerable on some level depending on what it is, what relationship it is, but like your, your authority over someone else has to ref re reflect the fact that Jesus claims that person for himself. And he doesn't, he, didn't, he never delegated his authority to you. Right, that's 1 Corinthians. Isn't Ephesians also that we're all under Christ and then we're in mutual submission to one another. So the three examples that he used of marriage, children, and a master, he's looking at those places where the biggest discrepancy can show up, but in those places, they're equals and need to submit to each other. Yes, good point, Kenneth. So, so we certainly can read Ephesians and Colossians more holistically and, and, and uh, more responsibly. And especially if we, um, if we do exegesis on Paul as a person, not just like in, individually, we, we take Colossians, for instance, and say, oh, let's just take this as, as if we don't know Paul, the author. So, uh, and, and Joanna, I think this is a great point. It, it, it can feel selective because what about all the other passages, right? So uh, uh, what, any last comment here? And then I'm gonna jump back into my presentation. I, I had a question. It's kind of random. So if, if you don't know, that's fine. Um, do, for just trying to get some of the context and like how far they can go both in Christ's ministry and in uh, some of Paul's letters, do you know if there's an, is it true that it was actually like illegal to uh, 
ask for manumission, to encourage manumission, to undermine slavery as an institution. And I've heard this come up and kind of framing like how far they can go. I, I'm just curious if, if that was actually the case from. Uh, to my understanding, it wasn't illegal to ask, but it was illegal to assist a runaway slave. And so if you know the, the Roman servile wars, you know, like Spartacus, that whole story of the slave uprisings, that's when the Romans started to uh, come down really hard on anyone who was enslaved. And, okay. and to say like, you, you can't help anyone run away or you, you can't, you, you got to turn a runaway slave over to the authorities. Okay, got it, got it, thanks. Yeah. Yep, very important. All right, let me jump back into my presentation. Okay. Ooh, I'm in bottom. Okay, so I'm gonna look at the Old Testament and New Testament quickly, we'll get a chance to discuss, okay? I think what we're, what we're seeing here and what we're grappling with is um, two major issues, scripture and then uh, church history, right? Scripture, were the early Christians right? And then we're, we're gonna unpack like, well, what, what exactly happened then with the US? And I'll just name right now that if you want more resources on it, uh, I have written <laughs> kind of extensive notes on slavery and Christianity in two parts. And, uh, in the Bible, and then from the first to the 15th centuries, like what exactly did, you know, Christians do? Uh, how did this trend continue and develop? And, and again, there were some Christians who made mistakes, uh, but on the whole, what you find is pretty, pretty thoughtful engagement with this. And then if you're interested in U.S. history, then look for um, material that is called A Long Repentance. And is this there we go. I need to move that out of the way. Because um, we, we touch on some of those things in, in that, which is a, an, another discussion um, series and its other material that we produce here at the Anastasis Center. Um, but I'm going to summarize it. So one basic question is, what do we do with the words ebedim and uh, dhuli, which, which are the Hebrew and Greek words for slaves? So ebed or ebedim in Hebrew or dulos or duli or dule in, in Greek. Uh, there are English translations who, who struggle with this. So the RSV, NRSV, NASV, ESV, they all translate these words slave. Uh, King James, Amplified, NIV, they translate these words servant or that's their tendency. Uh, but is that, so what should we do? Should it be something else? And that's where we get into the basic question of what words, how, what we say words mean depends on the context that they're in, that we find them in. And so let me give you an example. This comes from N.T. Wright. Uh, he, he takes this phrase, I'm mad about my flat. Now, if I said that to you, or if someone says that to you, what, what does that mean? Do you know what that means? I would say you don't. You may think you know what that means, but it depends on the context. Like you know all the words, but it, it depends on the context. If you're in the United States, probably that means I'm angry about my flat tire, right? But if you're a Brit in the UK, that phrase means I'm happy about my apartment. I'm mad about my flat. You see what I mean? You know all the words, but you don't know the, but if you don't know the context, you don't know what that phrase means because there's a, a range of possible meanings that those words can have. And, and so we have to be careful about making the word thing fallacy that just because something shares the same name doesn't mean it is the same thing. That's the word thing fallacy. And, and so the early Christians were really good at understanding how words are influenced by context and translation. I mean, this is how all the debates start. So, <clears throat> so in the Old Testament, for instance, what we call slavery or indentured servitude in English reflects the fact that ancient Israel's primary political and economic institution was the household. They did not have apartments or homeless shelters to house people. They didn't have banks to lend to people. They didn't have corporations to employ people, police to enforce laws. 
that's really significant because there are runaway slave law or runaway Ebedin laws that we'll have to reflect on in light of this fact. They didn't have prisons to incarcerate people or they didn't have halfway houses to rehabilitate people. Households on farmlands from all of those functions. That's really important context to understand. And so <clears throat> I'm gonna make the case here that, that the Hebrew word ebed or ebedim was specific to Israel's life in the garden land, life in the promised land. And it had something to do with, um, uh, with, with um, repaying a debt or, or seeking shelter or something like that, which is relatively mild. How do we know that? Well, it's because Jews in Alexandria or in the Dead Sea region did not practice slavery because they understood Genesis 1 to mean something about being on the land, being in a garden land. So in Alexandria, Philo of Alexandria records the Jewish community there uh, called the Therapeuti as they did not have slaves to wait upon them as they consider that the ownership of servants is entirely against nature. For nature has borne all men to be free, but the wrongful and covetous acts of someone who pursued that source of evil inequality have imposed their yoke and invested the stronger with power over the weaker. You see what's going on there. They're also reading Genesis 1 as, as if it regulates the other passages in Exodus, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy. That's their understanding as Jewish people. Here's the Jews in the Dead Sea region during the time of Christ and just before and, and to some, uh, uh, for about 135 years after, uh, the Essenes rejected slavery in principle as incompatible with the equality of all men before their creator, says Henry Chadwick describing the Essenes. And he's probably drawing on Josephus, who's a first century Jewish historian who says, who mentions this, there are about 4,000 men that live in this way and neither marry wives nor are desirous to keep servants as thinking the latter tempts men to be unjust. So they're a monastic community fascinating. If we look at the Old Testament and we ask, how did people tend to get into uh, slavery in the ancient world, like th just throughout the ancient world, and we break it down to sources, you have war captivity, for instance, kidnapping and piracy. You could be purchased from a slave trade, or you could be born to uh, slaves, like perpetual involuntary servitude. You could be sold by your parents or someone else. Uh, you, you could choose indentured servitude because of misfortune, you, or maybe you owe a debt, like you have to pay a debt back, but you don't have something to pay back with, so you have to work it off uh, w working on someone else's land. Uh, or, or it could be a penal servitude, like you, you have to, you're sentenced to work on someone else's land. Uh, or you, you choose voluntary servitude, or it's a term for political vassalage, like I am the Duke of York, but I am the slave of the king, right? Like, well, you're not a chattel slave, but you're adopting that language and deploying it in a certain way. So, so in the ancient world, all of these things were very common, very common. In, in the Old Testament, they are not common at all. And there's a slight difference between Hebrews and non-Hebrews, which we could talk about, but essentially it's pretty much the same, which is there's no war captivity, there's no kidnapping, there's no purchase from a slave trade, no birth to, you know, like you can't be born into slavery, that doesn't happen. Uh, your, your parents can't sell you. In fact, uh, you could indenture yourself for different reasons and, and you might be uh, uh, civically sentenced to work off a debt because maybe you were a thief. Uh, but it's very limited. And, and, and so let me get into that. So in Exodus 20, verse 15 and 17, <clears throat> there is no stealing and coveting. And in Exodus 21, verse 16, if he who kidnaps or steals a man or a woman or a child, whether he sells him or he's found in his possession, shall surely be put to death. In other words, in other words kidnapping is the death penalty. <laughs> that, according to the Sinai Covenant. Uh, 
which may or may not have been expressed at all times, but that was the magnitude of the sin. Uh, in Leviticus 25, God says, there's no slave trading, for they are my servants whom I brought out from the land of Egypt. They are not to be sold in a slave sale. In other words, if I owe you a debt and I can't pay it off monetarily, I come to work on your farm, you can't sell me to someone else. Debt is not a commodity that you can sell because that would be slave trading. My owing you is an act of trust, just as you lending to me was an act of trust. And so there's a relational context that is fixed. There's no trading the person or the debt. Uh, very limited self-indenture. Interest-laden loans were the chief cause of people being sold into slavery in many places and contributed, significant, eh, contributed significantly to slavery in classical Greek and Roman society. Uh, that's really important as we look at this. Loaning money with interest was strictly forbidden according to Jewish law. Wow. Wow. You can't tack on an interest rate because that was seen as exploiting someone who is in need. Like if I asked for a hundred bucks, you're within your right to say like, could you repay me a hundred bucks? But you are not within your right to say, how about a hundred five? That would be exploiting me. And in Deuteronomy 15, like every seven years, debts would be forgiven. And also you shall freely open your hand to him and shall generously lend him sufficient for his need in whatever he lacks. <laughs> Keep that in mind. Keep that in mind because we'll talk about what do we do about debt today? Uh, debts were canceled every seven years in Deuteronomy 15.1. And a thief who couldn't repay a theft could become a, an abed for a time. Like in Exodus 22, a thief is supposed to pay back two to five times as much uh, the amount that he or she stole. Why? Because they're, they have to rebuild trust. It's part of restorative justice. Um, that, that's important. Now, if I stole from you, I might not be able to repay <clears throat> two to five times as much, which means I have to come work on your land. And I'm surrounded by community, which will hold me to account. And uh, why is that? Because there were no prison systems in ancient Israel. Now, it's interesting, the 13th Amendment of the US Constitution permits penal servitude. And, and so there, there was this loophole that began to become bigger and bigger and bigger, which we'll get to. Slaves were set free after six years of service. That was mentioned or in the Jubilee year, like every 50 years, whichever happened first, or earlier, if they're redeemed by their family or by themselves. In Leviticus 25, it says, he may redeem himself. That means that slaves owned their own wealth, or the Ebedim could possess their own property. That's really important. That's really different from many uh, formal slave systems elsewhere, because in principle, if I'm your slave in Babylon, like everything I own is actually should be yours, right? Like, because you own me. So I, I actually shouldn't be able to own anything. But whatever this Ebedim principle and institution was in the Hebrew, uh, in the life of Israel, no, I, I was permitted to own wealth on my own. You see how that's different? Or bodily harm in Exodus 21. If you inflict some kind of permanent damage, even if it's knocking out a tooth of mine, uh, then I go free. Or when restitution is paid in the case of penal servitude, like if, I, if I'm done, obviously I get to go. Or escape, or escape. So Deuteronomy 23 verse 15 and 16 says this, you shall not hand over to his master a slave who has escaped from his master to you. He shall live with you in your midst in the place which he shall choose in one of your towns where it pleases him, you shall not mistreat him. Wow. Uh, I want to remind you there was no police force in Old Testament Israel, so running away was easy. Also, there were cities of refuge, that, but that was for something else. Uh, in essence, it, it shows like incredible freedom of mobility and mobility. So uh, this is what Raymond Westbrook says in a history of ancient Near Eastern law. A slave could also be freed by running away. 
this provision is strikingly different from the laws of slavery in the surrounding nations and is explained as due to Israel's own history of slavery, like in Egypt. It would have the effect of turning slavery into a voluntary institution. That's amazing. Uh, the Ebedim under the law of Moses held rights, right to the Sabbath, like rest on the Sabbath, to feast, to holy days. Um, the, the rest from labor was nearly half the, the time because of Israel's festival calendar. There were no large plantations or mines in Israel, only farmland to sustain the household. So master and servant would have worked together in the fields. There were no segregated quarters for indentured servants, the same level of lifestyle as others. They're, they had the absolute right to their bodies, like there was no sex slavery. It was only a contract of labor. They uh, retained kinship rights, marriage rights, and legal rights related to their physical protection and payments. And so they were protected from breach of contract. They had the right to testify in trials. They were free to move around. They were even free to own weapons. So <clears throat> uh, how do we know that? Genesis 14 records the story of Abraham having servants or Ebedim, and then he sent 318 of them armed to rescue Lot. <laughs> That's, cra That's crazy. The Ebedim could accumulate savings, wealth, property of their own, where personal wealth was not permitted in other slave systems. Crazy. Let me, and so I'll remind you that the household served all these functions. And so what we are seeing with this phrase, Ebedim, has to be understood from that context. In the New Testament, does that change? Somewhat, somewhat, because the church was a voluntary community that inherited the institution of slavery from outside itself. So whatever is going around, going on in the Greco-Roman world or the Persian world or the Chinese world or the Ethiopian world, yes, the church has to engage with it thoughtfully, but they do so from the understanding that they're connected to Israel and what God has already revealed about himself. So here's some context. In the Greek world, it was the first civilization to use mass slavery. Plato says barbarians were used, used for slaves. Aristotle uh, intensifies that from the hour of their birth. Some are marked out for subjection, others for, are for rule. And Plato and Aristotle owned slaves. Ro in Rome, the standard sources of slaves were war, birth, debt, basically all of them. But slavery was also a form of career advancement, right? Like you could en enslave your, you could indenture your, or become a slave to someone else's household or even a city. There was such thing as a bonded servant to like the city of Rome. And especially if you had skills like in accounting or something, uh, that might be a way to advance your career. So what's interesting is that manumission was relatively frequent in the Roman empire, although, Harboring a fugitive slave was punishable by death. So it was complicated. Now, how did the New Testament deal with this? The New Testament says no to all the same things that the Hebrew scriptures did and said, well, we can accept uh, Greco-Roman slavery on a limited basis. And let's get into that. So here are some factors affecting the New Testament understanding of, of slavery. Slavery is not intended from creation. They, they kept that. There was no warfare, violence, or land acquisition, so there's no war captives. Augustine started to kind of change that, but that was in the 400s. Um, uh, Jesus also taught that you should give up, be willing to part with all of your land inheritance and all of your wealth, which would certainly include slaves. There was no kidnapping, slave trading, or forced enslavement. That's explicit. 1 Timothy 1.10, 1 Thessalonians, and Revelation 18.13 condemns slavery. Jesus also wanted to bless all humanity so that there could be no such thing as like racial slavery or an entire class of people um, being enslaved. And also marriage and sexuality was returned to in Genesis 1 and 2, kind of whatever it was at the creation. So there's no sex slavery. So, in addition, the Christians added the human body is meant for Jesus' spirit, right? Like we, that is different from Israel. That's an intensification of what it meant, to, what, what Israel experienced of God. God came in the midst of Israel, like as a community. Now 
Jesus' spirit comes in into us, that's an intensification. So you've been bought with a price, and Jesus demonstrates how to be indwelled by the Holy Spirit. So th those are really important. Uh, and, and as we saw, like the, that's how Gregory of Nyssa, the, the leading fourth century theologians reasoned their way through it, showing that, yeah, that's, that was the critique all along. The, also, the church was a voluntary countercultural community. It was distinct from society and the state and people could voluntarily leave. So <clears throat> there's some, so there's some uh, thoughtful engagement with what are the, the civic reasons for uh, uh, having slaves. Uh, so, uh, and, and Christian ethics were for Christians, not for non-Christians, that's how they thought about it. Evangelism was the primary way of influence. And then they, they started to apply a sub-Christian ethics to non-Christians, like Constantine limiting slavery because it was considered so harmful. Um, it, it's not as if Christians could expect uh, the, the emperors to just say, we're gonna make the entire empire to, to follow the laws of Jesus because how do you allow voluntary leaving from an empire? Well, I, yeah, that's tricky. Uh, and, and Jesus did not prescribe punishments for, for crimes or sins. They it, it involved possibly excommunication from the church, but that's, that's a different issue. So there was always this tension between being the church and being a participant in the rest of society, uh, that, and that's a creative tension. The Christian household was a platform for Christian mission and in some ways intersected with that. So Yes, uh, Jesus started using households as platforms all the way back in his ministry with the 12 disciples, right? He says, go out and look for a household that is agreeable and, and then camp out there. And that continued into the New Testament. So the New Testament church used houses as meeting spaces. And for hospitality, they eventually began to use it as mini hospitals, like for the sick and the poor. But what that meant was that uh, the household members were, were involved in Christian mission. And so slaves and masters have the same Christian responsibilities for love, for mission, also for leadership and gifting. And so some of the questions that I had you think about before the class, this is why it's important. It's how do we read things like Ephesians, Colossians, and 1 Peter when the, Jesus gives the church a global mission. How do we relate to that? <clears throat> what if the Spirit gives the gifting of apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher to someone who is currently a slave? Right? How does the church respond to the gifts that the Spirit gives to people? Because the Spirit gives gifts very indiscriminately. The church has to respond to that and incorporate that. Then there are practical things. Can a master separate a husband and wife who are slaves or servants? The, the answer winds up being no. And can a widowed woman own or manage male slaves or servants? The answer winds up being yes in 1 Timothy 5 and 6. So, so, so it, there's a textured response. Christians care about how did these people become slaves in the first place? Some we can accept, others we do not accept at all. And... Uh, and uh, coercion is seen as evil. Like Paul says, give up threatening in Ephesians 6. Like give up threatening? Well, how do you keep someone in there if, <laughs> if you're not gonna threaten them? So you, you see some of the same things happening. Power is therefore redirected. And in Christian households, the masters have to become partners with everyone else to become sponsors of Christian mission because everyone else has the same responsibilities to Jesus and the masters have to respect that. So slaves had recourse to confront masters who sin or obstruct the Christian mission or ask for something immoral. Like in Matthew 18, there, there, there's a protocol uh, that's one place that it's talked about, like how do you confront someone who's sinning? And slaves had recourse to that. Uh, again, Christians said, all right, well, maybe 
debt was an acceptable. Um, social climbing is not acceptable. And Christian leadership is more important than slavery. And so what's really key to understanding the slave and master relations is how you sequence responsibilities, ideas, and texts. And that I, I demonstrated that by, by saying, it really matters whether you read 1 Corinthians first or whether you read Ephesians first. I mean, you should get to the same conclusions, I, I think that, but, but it really helps you to read 1 Corinthians first. Uh, and, and that's an illustration of how do you sequence texts. But even if you only read Ephesians, you should get to a place like this. Now, amongst themselves, Christians basically ignored the legal and social stigma of slavery. And so, you know, sometimes Christians were in non-Christian households. In two ways, either manumitting slaves and, and then supporting them. Marco, do you or, mind repeating? Yeah. Um, I think you cut out for a second. Um, I don't know if that was just me, but um, your screen went black and we couldn't hear you. Oh, was it this, this slide? Yes, I believe so. It was like maybe 15 seconds. I was out, I was not recording for, I was not on for 15 seconds. Wow, okay. So, so basically uh, th there's the, the situation, if you're a Christian and you are enslaved in a non-Christian household, First Peter 2, First Timothy and, and Titus discuss that a little bit. And so you were encouraged to respectfully serve to help the master and the rest of the household make commitments to Jesus. But the context is decently clear about that. The, um, to sum up, Christians had two ways of responding to uh, this thing that they inherited. One was manumit slaves and support them in the community. Uh, of Caesarea, uh, basically, he, they condemned many different sources of enslavement. So this is an example where Basil says, among men, no one is a slave by nature. In other words, God did not create people to be enslaved to one another. Uh, now, there are, we, there are situations that happen, and he discerns some of them. He says, for men are either brought under a yoke of slavery by war, conquest, or they're enslaved on account of poverty, or uh, by like children being kind of enslaved to older siblings because their parents made them <laughs> to do that. So that's not even the point of what he's writing. He's really right. This comes from a book called On the Holy Spirit. And he's explaining why the Holy Spirit was not a slave of God or a servant of God. And then he takes this small little detour and, and says, even among people, we discern like what is okay, what do we think about how people got into this situation? But that's not even his main point. So by raising, by, by raising the situation like this, he's just demonstrating that Christians were in the habit of, of uh, discerning, well, how did this particular person come to be enslaved? That's how we think about it. And that's how Gregory of Nyssa also says, like, slave trading is wrong. It's against the natural law. Uh, Clement of Rome says, well, even though probably we shouldn't do this, some people have actually sold themselves into slavery in order to ransom others out of slavery and provide food for others. Like, I don't know how, how they thought about Paul in 1 Corinthians 7 saying, do not become slaves of people, but I, there is this record here. Or they ignored it. They, they just said, we're going to just like focus on the person. Uh, because in a Christian household, you could do that. Now, later in war captivity, Augustine produced the, the just war theory, which was, you could, you could see it from both directions. Uh, you know, maybe it was a good effort. Maybe it was a, a compromise and a rationalization. But either way, 
from Augustine onward, people did start to think about just war theory, and therefore war captives became a thing that Christians now had to, to think about. And especially once Islam started taking over the Mediterranean world, that was a big uh, concern. But essentially, Christian faith dismantled slavery in all these places, France, Hungary, and all that, all that. And the only places in the world where slavery was abolished was because of Christian faith. So here I want to uh, send us into Zoom breakout rooms again. And Grant, if you could set those up again, um, you, may, you might have to reintroduce yourselves. And here are the questions. Does the Old Testament support the kind of slavery that existed in the US? Um, how are they different? How did Jesus' vision cause early Christians to break from Greco-Roman practices in their day? And if you know, if you know something about how Christians in the West um, rationalized slavery, what did Christians in the West need to ignore or deny in order to bring back chattel slavery? If it helps you, I will um, drop those questions in the chat. Yep. And so I, um, yeah, so I, I pasted them into the chat, Marco. Um, oh, awesome, thank you. Yeah, so people would have them. Um, one quickly before we get into the, um, there was there was one there was a question uh, that Joanna had asked uh, back uh, toward the beginning of the section. Um, so it was surrounding the uh, commands for for Israel to uh, kind of go into you know Israel and, uh, and and capture the land and stuff like that. I know that we get uh, into that in later on in the section about uh, what's you know the Bible formed under empire and those sessions. Um, do you want to? try to quickly respond to that? Or would you rather just uh, maybe table it and say, uh, we're, yeah. we're, we're gonna come up to it. Um, so, so hold on to that, yeah. Yeah, just hold on to that question and we'll, we'll come to it later. And Marco, just some context too. Um, Joanna had brought that up when you were talking about hierarchy. So, yep. yeah. All right, I'm just assigning the, the groups that they got a little, uh, defunct will take me just a second, almost there. Um, well, didn't realize they would reset from the beginning till now, uh, but almost there. Uh, you might be in different no. groups. Sorry about that, everybody. But you'll get to meet new people this way. That's okay. Let me pause with Zoom. Okay. I just want to. Briefly, oh, what happened? Um, did I stop doing that? Okay, do you see do you see the slideshow? Yes, I hope so. Okay. Um, so I just want to explain a little bit more of that last question. What did, especially in the US context, like what had to happen, what Christians had to do, uh, how they had to contort themselves in order to uh, bring back slavery. And then we'll have an open Q&A time. So uh, this will be quick. Um, to summarize, creation order, very important. And then the Bible, you know, in, in terms of, is the Christian faith a moral foundation for abolition? Yes. Uh, the Bible leaves open the possibility of applying sub-Christian ethics in pub public policy and intervention situations. That continues to be relevant, and um, we could have a range of opinion about that, but I think it's indisputably true. And, and so what happened is, why did Christians get involved in slavery? Well, to compete with the Ottoman Empire, first of all, because they controlled trade. Uh, Christians in Europe, especially Portugal and Spain, loved Indian spices, because who doesn't love Indian spices? But they didn't want to go through the Ottoman Empire and, and fund uh, their government and army. So they, they sailed around Africa. So they, they inherit, as they did that, they discovered, and this is interesting, that uh, Arab Muslim merchants and uh, uh, traders and maybe a few others ha had made inroads across the Sahara and set up on the coast outposts where they played off African tribes against one another and, and acquired slaves from that. Portugal, then Spain, and then Britain and France, uh, 
basically took over those ports and took over the slave, the, the kidnapping of people. Um, long story to that, uh, around West Africa and East Africa as well. And they were motivated because they wanted sugar. They wanted to grow sugar, which is uh, a plantation crop because it's so uh, hard to grow. And it's also semi-addictive. It's actually more addictive than crack. So th that was the reasons. Now, the argumentation for slavery in Great Britain, th there were there was the abolitionists and then there was the pro-slavery uh, movement. The evangelicals demonstrated very clear understandings about scripture. Why? Because in 1102, the London Church Council had abolished it. Now, the, the, there were some pro-slavery Anglican old, old money guys that argued about economics, but they did not argue from the Bible. That's really important. They're, they're like, but we're making a lot of money. It's good for the empire. But they didn't make a biblical case for it. So <clears throat> in reality, they, bought, they emancipated all slaves in 1833 and committed economic suicide. I know there's discussion about maybe it was in their self-interest to do that. Uh, I'm pretty sure Seymour Drescher, uh, the, the leading scholar on this is correct. And that is, it was not in their self-interest to do that but they did it anyway, they committed economic suicide. From that point, they realized, hey, we need to shut this down elsewhere in the world as much as possible because now in order to protect free labor, you, it's hard to compete with slave labor. Economically. So at that point, Yes, you can see slavery elsewhere. And so the British Navy blocked slave trading port, 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 ports all over the Middle East and Africa. That is the real, that's the really interesting thing. Uh, in the US, Christians justified slavery in the US by blunting Genesis 1 and 1 Corinthians 6 and 7. What was their arguments? Well, you, you know, in Hispaniola, the, what is now the Dominican Republic and Haiti, th those were the first encounters. They said non-white people are not human. Then they said they're under the curse of Ham or even the mark of Cain, even though that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> uh, then they said non-white people are less civilized, not fit for democracy. They're sub-Christian. So even if they become Christian and we acknowledge like, oh, maybe they have souls, they're not fully Christian. And then it turned into only some white people can have land and on and on and on. But those are the main ideas. Now, uh, in some circles in the US, there continues to be this excuse, like slavery was evil, but the American founding fathers were men of their time. But when we look at this history, that shows it, that is not right at all. The, the, the founding fathers knew that they were going origins uh, because the larger pattern is that capitalism always looks for cheap land and labor to exploit. So powerful white men wanted to practice heresy by reinterpreting church history and redefining biblical words. They knew about 1102 and the London Church Council. That's how the law started in the UK that if a slave sets foot on the soil of England, he or she is free. And James Somerset, who is an African man who sailed from Boston on a ship with his master to London and set foot on the soil of London, he became free. He eventually, he ran away and then was caught, but he sued for his freedom because he understood this and abolitionists backed him and he won his freedom. And in the US constitution, there is explicit um, argument against that. Like they knew basically a fugitive slave principle, like you have to return fugitive slaves. So they're aware of this. Culturally, um, how did Christians understand language? Well, they were influenced by this thing called the Scottish School of Common Sense, which basically says words mean what I say they mean. Like understanding things should be simple, including understanding the ancient world. Like it should be really simple. So it goes like this. Oh, what I call slavery here is, is, is what it is. And then the Bible uses the word slavery or the King James translated it slavery or whatever. And, and so essentially 
what slavery is here, it also is there. So they're committing the word thing fallacy, like, right, I'm mad about my flat, and, and saying, hey, it's really obvious, isn't it? Just look at the word. Well, that's a uh, fascist. That's a fascist used language like that. And so th there is a real challenge to the conservative right, especially the Christian right, which goes like this. The Christian right often charges, quote, the left with changing the meaning of words like resurrection, like love and marriage, right? That's the argument that the right makes against the left. Uh, or progressive Christians make against conservative Christians. But the pattern actually began with slavery. And all these words start to bend around the practice of chattel slavery, like salvation. How many of you have heard, we have to save souls? Well, what about saving bodies? Does salvation, is, is it something that only happens to the soul? Well, not in the Bible, but that's how salvation gets defined. Or how about righteous or, and righteousness? How many of you have heard that, well, we have no righteousness on our own, so it really doesn't matter what we do with law? Or that righteousness refers to things like, are you praying, right? Like, it, it's about piety. But the word for justice in scripture is actually, in, in, in the Greek, is the same as righteous, right? It's dikaiosini. So righteousness and justice are the same, but modern Christian right wingers make a big deal that they are not the same. Or when there is the word justice, they say justice is retributive and not restorative, even though all throughout scripture, divine justice is restorative. Uh, more examples not directly related to this, but since people are in the habit of just interpreting words badly, they look at the six days of creation in Genesis 1 and say those must mean six 24-hour days. That is the worst possible way to interpret Genesis 1. Or they say Israel, the word Israel, means the state of Israel, or essentially that the state of Israel is biblical Israel. When we think about how are the Palestinians being treated, there is no possible way that that could be true. I mean, that that's not even true, just in a in a basic hermeneutical sense. Or the idea of the rapture happens like the, the idea that true Christians will be raptured into the clouds because oh, Paul and Daniel use this phrase in the clouds or into the clouds. Well, in Daniel and Paul, it refers to enthronement, like being lifted up in the heavens and. Being, being supreme, it, it doesn't mean that all of a sudden, like, true Christians are going to disappear from in their clothes, like, we're going to leave our clothes behind and be gone, but that conservative Christianity in the U.S. Sorry, Marco, has can I, this pattern of, of um, you're, you're um, coming in okay, a little bit it. choppy. Oh, okay. Um, it might help if you turn your video off and, and your audio may be more consistent, but yeah. Sure. All right. Um, I, I don't want to repeat that. But here's the challenge to liberals. So after the Civil War, a lot of Christians who were abolitionists, uh, and, and rightly so, but they had to do it under a certain framework. And, and so after the Civil War and the 13th Amendment were, uh, the war was done and the amendment was passed, they looked at themselves and said, we've done better than the Bible. And, and from that point, there began a lot of uh, optimism, like, hey, we could do better than Paul, Jesus and Paul. Like, look, look the, apparently they didn't even abolish slavery, but we did. And so we are actually doing better than scripture. So, so then they're, they're kicked in this idea that we can interpret scripture in a moralistic way. And we know, we know that these miracles didn't happen either. And so Jesus's resurrection must be psychological, not physical. Like it was something Jesus, 
resurrected himself in the hearts and minds of his disciples, but his body was really in the tomb because science tells us dead people don't rise again. That's the kind of thing that happened. Um, and that becomes a real problem for what, you know, the mainline denomination, mainline Protestantism uh, uh, became. And so this is in spite of the fact that social gospel liberal Protestants did not address the failure of reconstruction, white only labor unions, which was actually the first uh, major kind of civil rights movement, uh, you know, after reconstruction or white supremacy in the New Deal, and only rarely did they address US imperialism. So this idea uh, among liberal Protestants, we've done better than the Bible, it is arrogant. Historically, liberals share the blame with conservatives for building the, the prison state, the carceral state. If you want to read Princeton scholar Naomi Murakawa about that, you can. Um, and, and here's what I mean here. Uh, look how often wage theft happens today. Does God condemn wage theft? Yes. It, it is an aspect, or it is kind of in parallel or orthogonal to Abedin, you know, in the Hebrew scriptures. Yet, and God condemns it. And yet we don't, like it's not even illegal. So stolen wages, uh, it, there are more wages stolen than all other forms of theft put together. Burglaries, robbery, shoplifting, auto theft, Wage theft is not a crime. So 2.4 million workers lose $8 billion annually in the, in the 10 most populous states. And, and then we don't care about wage stagnation enough, declining purchasing power and job losses. Meanwhile, billionaires. <laughs> I, I, what I mean by that is basically the same thing AOC means, which is every billionaire is a policy failure. Like billionaires make their money because they, they use roads they use the internet, they, they use more resources than everyone else, and they don't get taxed for it, right? And, and so Warren Buffett says, like, my secretary pays more in taxes as a percent than I do. So meanwhile, billionaires, billionaires are a policy failure. So we allow all this. Debt, let's look at our debt practices. Clearly in Jewish law and in Jesus' teaching, they're very concerned about indebtedness. Are we concerned about indebtedness in the U.S.? What, well, not from what well we are, but not enough on the policy standpoint, right? Like you look at student debt, mortgage debt, medical debt, credit card debt. I mean, debt is a way to uh, make people worried and work work for lower wages and work more. So it's a way to manipulate the workforce. There are far fewer protections from poverty or bankruptcy than in the Hebrew scriptures, which again, that's the leading way. Indebtedness is the leading way in the ancient world why people got into slavery. How much do we protect people from indebtedness today? Hardly none. <laughs> Biden is struggling to forgive student debt. And the wealth gap is larger than ever and it's growing. By the way, between blacks and whites today, uh, there's an increase of four times uh, from 20,000 to 95,000 uh, since before the financial crisis to after. So our banks planned on repossessing our homes, uh, our housing market and mortgage market exploits the need for housing. So, <clears throat> and gets us into debt. Penal servitude is, I mentioned that, it's already a huge issue. The use of prison labor, for instance, if you have lingerie, you rely on telemarketing, it might be done by prisoners who are working for as little as 17 cents an hour with no benefits, overtime, union laws, sick days, and pensions. So there's not much concern to reintegrate returning citizens today. Whereas in the Hebrew scriptures, if an Ebed, an Ebed uh, a person who became an, an Ebed uh, had to indenture themselves to another household, there was lots of concern of how does this person come back to full citizenship in Israel, full human flourishing? Today, we don't do that. Uh, and so incarceration rates in the US are really high. Um, the US imprisons more people than China, India, and Iran combined. California, California's prisons alone are more than France, Great Britain, Germany, Japan, Singapore, and the Netherlands. And we imprison more black men than South Africa did during apartheid as a percentage of the black male population. 
So we can learn more about that if you want in Michelle Alexander's book, The New Jim Crow, and also a study guide that we wrote to accompany it. There are also problems in our criminal justice system with racial bias and the culture of prisons and so on. Labor traffic, and, and, and those are things that nominally are, are legal, <clears throat> things that are illegal nominally, but we don't, we just don't know how to deal with them. Uh, labor trafficking, which is another form of slavery. When we think about cobalt in the Congo and the use of child labor there, we look at Hershey chocolate, which is harvested from West African cow plantation by children who are often tricked and enslaved. Uyghurs in China are used in forced labor camps. About 20% of the world's cotton products come from there. There are sweatshops, fair trade laws, are good, but they're not always effective, depending. And the explosion of sex trafficking means that we need a third abolition. The first abolition, meaning the Christian abolition in, in Europe. The second abolition, meaning the first the British abolition of the transatlantic slave. And now we need a third abolition. That raises some deep questions about whether other belief systems uh, are really amenable to abolition, like in Islamic societies, the Prophet Muhammad owned slaves. Uh, female concubines were permitted. That's what drove the Islamic slave trade across Africa, the Middle East, and Eastern Europe. And there have never been an abolitionist movement, movements in Islam. Europeans took over the Islamic slave ports in Africa and shut them down. And uh, what that later became was uh, the UN, essentially. Uh, abolition was forced onto Islamic countries by the British and then by the, in some ways, political pressure by the UN, uh, although it still exists. So uh, that, that becomes a big question for us. When we think about, for example, engaging with more trade uh, with India, for instance, we have, and we look at our trade policies or we think about activism abroad, how is it that we're going to deal with all of this slavery and products made with slavery? So slavery and abolition, really, it's a collision of multiple belief systems and issues. The question that I'm raising here is, at the end here is, can atheism or secularism serve as a moral foundation? Well, I don't know. I mean, John Gray, who is not a Christian, and he was a professor of European thought at London, said secular humanism is a Christian heresy. It's a hollowed out version of Christianity. Um, he was not optimistic <laughs> about like being secularism itself, just running out and confronting other belief systems. As we have seen, we've become less powerful um, we, by, by just accepting, I don't know, you know, Chinese forced labor as, uh, along with Saudi oil and Russian gas. We have not had the strength to stand up to those things. Maybe now we will, but that really depends. Uh, Friedrich Nietzsche said, if you cut the root, you lose the fruit. And meaning if you cut the root of Christian faith, eventually you, you lose the fruit of abolition here in this context. So that could serve as a warning. Other thoughts to ponder when scripture ex expresses concern about slavery, whatever it gets translated slavery what's it really concerned about it's how do people fall into it and are we equally concerned about it there are other questions that are really good that are beyond what we can talk about here like can christians use force to abolish slavery if so how like we look at how emperor constantine and clovis ii and batilde used force or the british navy did it could we do something similar those are not easy questions to answer but they're worth asking and how to process US slavery, it's just one expression of plantation capitalism, which was a manifestation of heresy. People fled church authority in Europe in order to practice heresy. And if you compare it with the Catholic social teaching or Eastern Orthodox ecological ethics and, and others, you can see that really clearly. So US history includes many attempts to escape historic Christian ethics. And the conflict between liberal versus evangelical Protestantism in the US actually flows from slavery. <laughs>
and the debates about slavery, and also a certain kind of instability brought about by <laughs> Protestantism. Let me stop there. If you want more information, uh, that it's here on this uh, slide or throughout the slide presentation, which I will make available to you guys later. All right. I'm sure you guys have a lot of questions. I'm sorry I went so long. I um, messed up with the time. But uh, I'm happy to hang out for a bit. And um, Marco, just for planning purposes, should we plan two hours for the rest of the classes? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, it, including the Q&A, like I did want to leave a lot more time for Q&A. Um, unfortunately, the I, yeah. Yeah, I, I need to hop onto another meeting at, and let me start my video again, at one o'clock. And so I did want to leave, I do want to leave more time for Q&A in the future. I apologize. So will the PowerPoint and the other like references be available on your site? Yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll send out an email to the whole list with the video link and because that will be up on my um, Zoom cloud. Um, but I'm happy just to take a couple questions and then then I have to hop off. Uh, Maka, at the beginning of the class, you quoted from someone saying they were talking about uh, that owning another person is trying to do something that even God doesn't. Um, and that's that's a rough paraphrase, but you'll perhaps remember the quote. Um, I'm just curious to know, like I recently was rereading Ignatius of, Ani of Antioch, and he talks a lot about submission to bishop and submission uh, to various authorities. And I'm curious to know if you could speak a little bit to the relationship between uh, submission, to, submission to the mediated authority of God versus the kind of submission that you see in like a slave relationship. Yeah, I think submission to the early church was uh, when, you're, when you're reading things like that, especially to a Christian leader or, or someone who is, is teaching, it's, it's circumscribed, it's limited. As opposed to, right, because, we'll, and we'll, we will really get into this next time, um, when Paul talks about, we'll look at that famous passage in 1 Corinthians 11, when he talks about men and women prophesying and praying in the congregation, because that's a form of headship that's rooted in the teaching of Jesus and, and staying within the teaching of Jesus. So, um, yeah, that, and we're called to submit to Jesus in that but that's different from me just telling you what to do like Hayden just go buy my groceries and go to the store or or in the case of Greco-Roman slavery outright ownership right like to own a person and own their bodies and and to treat them as not human that is strictly forbidden so so I would say submission implies uh love and freedom and, and the authority there is, is circumscribed. It's limited. Great, yeah. that's helpful. Um, I, have, I have a question. Um, I don't wanna get like too historical, but um, I know like when um, Christopher Columbus sailed to Haiti, like the first time, a lot of the people who came with him were like on mission and they would read this thing called the requirement to the Haitian people and say, you know, you have to become a Christian or else we reserve the right to do basically anything that we want. And so they would wage war, they would enslave people, all of those things. And so I just wonder um, like where that falls into the discussion if people are literally going on mission and end up enslaving and waging war against the native people. That's a great question. And, and what is your name, please? Um, my name's Annie. Annie, thank Hi. you for that question. Well, ever since 1452, when Pope Nicholas uh, d issued the papal bull called um, Dum Diversas, which reinterpreted non-Christians as enemies, right? Like it, then Christ European Christians, that, and that's where the doctrine of discovery comes from. But, but essentially, 
uh, non-Christians were not just um, people to be loved with the love of Jesus. They were political enemies who you could take their land, you could actually take their freedom. It, it comes from that point um, in an official sense. I mean, so, so what Columbus was doing was following that precedent. Now, the Catholic Church reversed themselves, um, arguably, in the 1500s, and, and certainly the Pope have apologized for it since, but, the, um, but it does come from a certain explicit teaching, and uh, I, I can send you more information about that later. Last question, then, and I need to run. I had a question about, so um, you kind of explained the system in which uh, uh, the, the context in which uh, Jewish people understood slavery, um, that, you know, there's a lot of limitations to what, um, to like how long someone could serve and there's, uh, you know, people would naturally be freed, ear of shoe, bleach, all this stuff. But my, my question is like, what is stopping people from taking advantage of that? and um, just saying, oh, like, I'm going to borrow money from you, and um, I'm just going to, you know, not pay it back or something, and if, uh, and then if you ask me to, like, you know, work for you as an indentured servant or something, I'll just run away, and then I'm free, like, yeah, and, and what, what is, like, the motivation for it? I, I guess my thought is, um, uh, is the motivation actually just, like, shame and not want, and uh, like love for your community that you choose to do that even if you don't want to? Yeah, that's my question. That's a great question. So in the Old Testament, I mean, the understanding of people's relationship with God and the land is such that God helps you repay the debt because you work on the land and God helps you be fruitful. So if you're not on the land, like Israel goes into exile, or if you're not actually Jewish and we're reading the Old Testament, we don't insert ourselves into that uh, period of the story. Now, however, having said that, Jesus does intensify teaching about forgiving debt. It's not just every 50 years. It's not just every seven. It's like as often as you possibly can. So um, do I think that something is wrong with our banking system? Absolutely. Yeah, because it's very exploitative. So, you know, what to do exactly, uh, there's, there's a range of opinions about that, but the, <clears throat> uh, it, it comes from understanding the flow, the whole flow of the story. Um, Christians used to have a lot more vigorous critique about interest rate lending. Um, we stopped that at the point of, well, uh, at different points. Uh, following John Calvin, the Puritans, and so on. But um, we'll get into that a little bit more later as well. Hmm. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Friends, I need to get going, so let me stop recording. Thank you for being here, and we'll look forward to, I'll be in touch by email. I look forward to seeing you next week. Have a great week. Thanks, Mako. Thanks, Mako. Bye-bye.